Good evening, campers. That's a real North Queensland welcome. Can I just say it again because it could have been a bit louder. Good evening, everybody. That's better. That's what I would expect from North Queensland. I, I was trying to think when we were last here. I think it might have been at a camp maybe seven or eight years ago. And I'm rather surprised how old some of you are looking. <laughs> I haven't changed. But some of you have. And, uh, but it's wonderful to be back. I, uh, we left a lot of friends when we were here before and it's always good to come back to North Queensland. Kirin Bong was about uh, 13 or 14 degrees yesterday morning when we left and to come up here to 27 and 28 degrees at this time of the year is marvellous. So it's always a warm welcome in more ways than one. Well, we're going to do some wonderful things during this week in terms of reviewing our past, tracing footprints in the sand. You know, footprints are impressions that tell us that someone has passed that way before us. And if we're following them, footprints also tell us the direction that they travelled. And for those who study footprints very closely, they can tell us much more about those who made those footprints. But tracing footprints in time is also important for those who follow behind. And I count it a very real privilege to be here with you for these hundred years of celebration since the message was first established in this wonderful part of Australia. You know, when we think of those pioneers, those men and women who placed footprints in the sands of time, they came with tremendous faith and courageous determination, and we're going to hear some of those stories during this week. They came with a new message that they believed was to be proclaimed to every kindred, nation, tongue and people. And today I'm looking into the faces of those who are following in the footsteps of those men and women a hundred years ago. I believe, dear friends, it's important that we retrace footsteps. I believe it's very important that we recall the past, that we understand what impelled those pioneers to come to the northern parts of Australia and endure much hardship and privation. What brought them here? What led those men to cycle hundreds and hundreds of, of kilometres out into central Queensland just on a bicycle in roads that are far worse than the ones that we have today? I marvel at their courage. I marvel at their determination. But what impelled them, my friends, was that they believed they had a message. They had a message to proclaim to this part of Australia. And today you are called to build on the foundations that they laid so long ago. I have always been impressed by these words. The first step, they were written by a historian, the first step in liquidating a people is to erase its memory, destroy its books, its culture, its history. Before long, that nation will forget what it is and what it was. A very significant statement, my friends, that if you want to liquidate a people, destroy a nation, one of the first steps is to erase its history so that people cannot look back and think about what was done in the past. Because when that happens, my friends, it affects the identity of a people. And I believe with all my heart that the same is true of a church. If we forget our past, we will forget our identity. We will forget the reason for our existence. And that will dramatically affect our understanding of our future. God knows this. And I want to read to you tonight some words of a psalmist. I, I will not, during the week, put any words of scripture onto the screen. I think it's very important that you should read these words in your own Bibles. And if you didn't bring them tonight, my friends, may I encourage you each night this week because we're going to delve into God's word. But I want to read to you some words from the psalmist Asaph. It's the second longest psalm in the book, Psalm 78. And it's a contemplation, it's called, of Asaph. And Asaph the psalmist is making a strong appeal in this psalm for God's people to pass on to their children and their children's children the wonderful things that God has done in our past history. These are stories of the mighty acts of God. And listen to the words of the psalmist. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. 
I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, telling to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he's done. For he established a testimony in Jacob, and he appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, the children who would be born, that they may arise and declare them to their children. What's the purpose of this instruction? Why should parents and grandparents pass on to their children and their grandchildren the great and wonderful things that God has done in the past? He tells us in verse 7, listen to the words, in order that they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. You know, dear friends, hope is a very wonderful word. It's wonderful to have hope in times of stress, pain and uncertainty. And how much as we look out on the world that has changed and is changing so drastically from the time you were here in camp last year, how much the people of this world need hope. And as it was with the people of God in ancient times, so it is true of the people of God today. It's important for us to pass on the great and wonderful deeds that God has done in the past as we look at the footprints of those who went before us. Recalling God's wonderful acts, tracing his footprints, will bring us hope and trust and confidence in Christ. And my dear friends, I hope that during the evening meetings of this week, that is certainly one of my aims, that we might set, that you might set your hope anew in God and not forget his wonderful works as we trace these pioneers and their actions. Over 120 years ago, in 1881, God's messenger to this church wrote some words that I know you have heard often, and it's become, in fact, almost a cliché among us. But clichés are clichés because they express truth. And I want you to read these words, and I'd like you to read them with me. In reviewing our past history, having travelled over every step of advance to our present standing, I can say, praise God. As I see what the Lord has wrought, I am filled with astonishment and with confidence in Christ as leader. Now remember, can I just interrupt here, these words were written in 1881. Ellen White was looking back at that time to 37 years of the history of this great Adventist movement. But as she was looking back over 37 years, she could say, praise God, I'm filled with astonishment and with confidence in Christ as leader. And then these words, read them. We have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. Nothing to fear. Nothing to fear. Are you fearing the future, my friends? Many people are. Nothing to fear. What a relief it would be to a troubled world to know that there's nothing to fear about the future except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. When we do remember, I believe it will give us courage, it will give us confidence, it will give us hope, and it's that assurance and hope that I would bring to you tonight. Tonight we shall review tracing footprints and particularly look at his coming, our certainty. And in the messages to follow during this week, his sanctuary, our redemption, his judgment, our confidence, his final crisis, our preparation, his righteousness, our assurance, and finally, his grace, our hope. So stay with me during this week. It's not without a reason that in 1860, we as a people took the name Seventh-day Adventist. To bring before the world two cardinal points about our faith, and both find their existence and their reason for existence in Jesus. The Sabbath, Jesus' gift. The Advent, Jesus and our hope. Why are we Adventists? Why are we Adventists? Let's go back to the early 1880s. 
At that time, great changes, or the early 1800s rather, great changes were sweeping over the world, and particularly in that very young nation in those days, the United States of America. Changes in communication, in travel, in education, and even in the Christian church were preparing the world for the great events of the time of the end spoken of by Daniel the prophet. But at such a time in the early 1800s, God began to move upon the heart of a man. Not a schoolman, not one educated in the great halls of learning, not an eloquent, self-confident speaker, but as God so often does when he lays his hand on a man, one who was taught in the school of life, like Amos, a farmer, and equipped him for his task. And without question, my friends, the movement that that man was about to lead out in left a tremendous impression, not only upon the people of the United States, but upon the world, and as it reached out to North Queensland, even here. His name was William Miller. Born in 1782 in Massachusetts, the eldest of 16 children, and at the age of four, his family moved to Lowhampton. Now, I don't have a map, but Lowhampton is in the state of New York, right on the eastern side, right next almost to the border with the state of Vermont, for those of you who know your American geography. And at the age of four, his family moved to Lowhampton in New York State, took up farming. And he was taught by his godly Baptist mother to reverence the Bible as God's revelation to the world. Young Miller had an intense love for books, he tells us and a deep thirst for knowledge. And he was blessed with a remarkably retentive memory. And in 1803, he married a young woman, Lucy, and together they set up home just over the border into the state of Vermont in a little town called Poultney. Here he came under the influence of the leading men of the village of Poultney. But they happened to be deists by persuasion. Maybe I need to unpack that a little bit more because I... I'm sure that there will be nobody in this congregation tonight who are deists. A deist is somebody who believes in God, but he believes in a very different God to the kind of God that I'm sure we believe in tonight. There are two words that are very similar to each other. There is a deist and a theist. A deist is based upon the Latin word for God, and a theist is based upon the Greek word for God. A deist believes in a God. But it's a God who created the world way back in the past and then withdrew from the world. No longer interested in the world, some have described it as being like an absentee landlord because he created the world, set it under law and withdrew to the edge of the universe and never showed any more interest in the world that he had created. And so if you are a deist, you don't believe in a God who hears prayer and answers prayer. If you're a deist, you don't believe that God has ever given us his word because he's no longer interested in the people of this world. Why would he turn a book to them? You know, certainly don't believe in a saviour because if you're a deist, why would this God who's gone to the edge of the universe ever show any interest to come back and live in this world? And young William Miller, brought up in a Baptist home, Come, comes now under the influence of the leading men of the village of Poultney who are deists. Men who denied the existence of a personal God who ruled in the affairs of the world and under their influence William Miller concluded that the Bible was not to be trusted, that it was a fabrication of designing men. And so he discarded the Bible. However, events brought uh, uh, doubts in his mind about deism. He was horrified by the doctrine that if you, when you're dead, you are dead for eternity. That greatly troubled him, he tells us. And in 1812, he was appointed captain of a group of men who fought in the war with Britain for the next few years. And when he returned in 1816, he came back and purchased a 200-acre farm and built this home. You can visit this home. It's a fascinating place to, vi to, to, to visit a home that was purchased by the church and is now one of the historical sites in the United States. And here he built this home. His study was there at the bottom, uh, on the left-hand side. And uh, over the next few years, William Miller begins to respond to the Spirit of God working in his heart. 
And later in 1816, through a series of providential events, William Miller, now 34 years of age, is reconverted. And I want you to notice what he said about his experience at that time. I was constrained to admit that the scriptures must be a revelation from God. They became my delight, and in Jesus I found a friend. The scriptures, which before were dark and contradictory, now became the lamp to my feet and light to my path. The Bible now became my chief study, and I can truly say I searched it with great delight. I found the half was never told me. Oh, what a wonderful change came into the life of this man, now 34 years of age. And you notice in that statement that he says two things that I want you to notice tonight. The scriptures became my delight, he says, and in Jesus I found a friend. And it was that friendship, that desire to study the word of God, that impels this man of God to begin a movement that has touched the life of every one of us here in this tent tonight. Do you know for the next two years, from 1816 to 1818, with only an $18 Bible, he tells us, and an $8 copy of Cruden's Concordance, and with the marginal notes in his Bible, Miller began with Genesis 1 verse 1 and studied every text of Scripture through the Old Testament into the New Testament and ended up with Revelation. And if he ever came to a spot in the Bible that he couldn't understand, he would go to the Concordance and look up every time that word was found in Scripture. And in those two years, my friends, this man who fell in love with Jesus and who fell in love with the Scriptures became a master of the Word of God. He tells us that often he spent whole nights in prayer, earnestly searching, examining the Bible. He was searching for truth. And what did he find from his study? Well, of course, first of all, he found the friendship with Jesus. But there were three things. We've got time tonight only to look at very quickly three things that troubled him. But before I mention the first, I want you to notice something. We need to understand as we think about the impact of the second coming of Christ on his life and on our lives today, that in those days, in the early 1800s, when William Miller began to preach and began to study the word of God, the common belief among most Christians in the United States of America was that Christ would come after the millennium. Now, without becoming too technical tonight, you'll see why William Miller's preaching had such an impact. Because this post-millennial view, believing that Christ was coming after the millennium, put the second coming at the end of the thousand years. And in the intervening time, there would be a thousand years of peace, and the gospel would be preached to the whole world, and God's kingdom established on earth. But if you put the second coming of Christ at the end of the thousand years, William Miller was living down here in the 1800s and people in America in the early 1800s believed that with all the things that were happening in the world, the changes that were happening, that they were on the edge of the millennium. There was one whole college that was established in the United States of America purely because they believed that the millennium was about to begin, the world had to be converted and therefore they needed to train young people to go out and help establish the millennium. Interesting that a college should be established on that idea and that college still exists in the United States today. And so this was the prevailing view that Christ was coming but not for another thousand years because they saw that they were on the edge of the millennium down here then Christ's second coming was at the end of the millennium and that means a thousand years off into the future. But the more William Miller studied his scriptures, the more he realised that the coming of Christ was before the millennium. But then that wasn't all that he discovered. He discovered as he came to the book of Daniel particularly, he was impressed by that text that most of us know so well. In Daniel 8 verse 14, as he came to the book of Daniel, opened the 8th chapter after studying all the chapters before it, he came to that text the longest time prophecy in the Bible. And he believed that those 2,300 days would be fulfilled as 2,300 years and would be fulfilled about 1843, 1844. Miller accepted the Bible principle that was widely accepted in those days that a day stood for a year in Bible prophecy. 
And so he believed that they would reach down those 2,300 years to about 1843. And then the third great fact that this man came to a conclusion about was that at the end of the 2,300 years, the sanctuary would be cleansed. And he believed that the cleansing of the sanctuary was the second coming of Christ. We know today that he was wrong. But he was an honest man searching the scriptures and when he came to that word sanctuary, he looked up in his Crudence Concordance all the texts that mentioned the word sanctuary in the whole of the Bible. And he concluded finally after examining those many, many texts that the sanctuary, and he was wrong of course, was the earth and the church to be cleansed by fire at the second coming of Jesus. And so he tells us in 1818, at the end of that two-year period of study, he came to the solemn conclusion that in about 25 years' time, all the affairs of our present state would be wound up. Jesus was going to come. You know, dear friends, I've had the privilege of standing and visiting the grave of William Miller. He is buried not far from that home that I showed you on the screen just a little while ago. You know, Ellen White says something very interesting about the grave of William Miller. This is the only one that she ever says this about in all of her writings. That angels watch over the grave of William Miller and in the resurrection he shall come forth. She doesn't say that about many people. But she says it about William Miller. And as I stood that day and took this photograph of William Miller's grave, I was reminded that angels watch over the grave of this great man of God. But do you notice that there is a text written above here on the top of his gravestone? When you go a little bit closer, you will find that on that text on his grave, on, Dan on the left-hand side, is Daniel 8.14. Under 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And on the other side is Daniel chapter 12 and verse 12, referring to the 1,335-day prophecy. Well, William Miller, after coming to that conclusion that Jesus was going to come, for years he delayed telling people the world of his conclusions. He was too old, he said. He was only a farmer. But he continued his exhaustive Bible study. And that only served to confirm his conclusions. And then we come to that momentous month that I'm sure you have heard about and read about. But it's good to recall the past. In August 1831, coming under such strong that he had to tell people that Jesus was coming soon. There in this maple grove, and the picture that I have on the screen is the man who took the part of William Miller in uh, Keepers of the Flame. And I took this picture when he was playing the part there in the maple grove because just beyond William Miller's home that he built is a large maple grove that is still there today. And in August 1831, you may remember that William Miller made a bargain with God. What was the bargain? If anybody invites me to preach, and nobody had invited him to preach for 49 years because he was now a 49-year-old farmer. And he felt safe in saying to the Lord, if anyone invites me to preach, I'll go. But you know, dear friends, it's, it's, it's a danger to make a bargain with God because God has his habit of keeping his part of the bargain. And within half an hour, within half an hour of Miller praying that prayer that August morning, there was a knock at the door. His young nephew was there and he said, Father can't preach in Dresden, a little town, a little not far away from Miller's home. Will you come and preach tomorrow about what you have discovering from your word, the Bible? You know, Miller was so angry that his little daughter remembers to, this, to, to the day of her death what happened that morning. She said she saw her father rise up out of his study, go to the back door, slam open the back door, go across to the maple grove, and there he knelt in agony before God. But you know, as somebody has said, Miller went into that grove a farmer and came out a preacher. Because he came out that day and the next day he went to Dresden, and during the following week, because they had pity on this old farmer because he didn't want to preach in the church, they had the meetings in a home. But people were converted. 
And when William Miller came back the next week, at the end of that week, he found to his surprise a letter addressed to William Miller from the pastor of the church in Poultney, the little village where he had met the deists and he'd lived for so long. And to his amazement, he found that that letter was inviting him to preach and that man didn't know that William Miller had spent the week preaching in the little town of Dresden. And he took this as a clear sign from God that God was opening the doors. Go, William Miller, and preach. And you know, here's a copy. I found this copy of the license that the Baptist Church gave him in 1833. Recognising his abilities as a preacher, giving him a license to preach. And between 1832 and 1844, Miller preached 3,200 sermons in more than 500 towns and cities across the United States, sometimes to eight to 10,000 people. And with the approach of the longest and the most significant time prophecy, God raised up at that time a whole army of prophetic interpreters. Soon ministers joined William Miller. Do you know from some 700 to 2,000, that's the way historians estimate, ministers of all persuasions joined William Miller in that movement. In England there were some 700 Anglican clergymen proclaiming the soon coming of Jesus in the 1840s. There was more than 100 great public rallies that convened between 1840 and 1844. Between 1842 and 1844, 125 camp meetings met in across America with attendances up to 10,000 people. Do you know that they estimate that one in every 35 Americans of the time attended an Adventist camp meeting between 1842 and 1844? They purchased the largest tent as William Miller preached, soon the, the halls became too small. And so this drawing I found in a newspaper of the time, view of Father Miller's tent and campground at Newark. This was the largest tent that had ever been erected in the United States up till that time. It originally seated 4,000 and it had two poles that they put up and in between the two poles was a banner, Thy Kingdom Cometh. And its centre poles were 20 metres high and it was so small in its atten the attendance that it could seat, they put a splice in so it could seat 6,000 people. And it had attracted them as they spoke about the soon coming of Jesus. They printed many journals. These are some of them that were printed at the time. Some of the leading journals bearing their urgent message that Jesus was coming soon. And look at the titles. Signs of the Times, printed in 1840. The Midnight Cry, The Trumpet of Alarm, The Voice of Truth, The Voice of Elijah. These great journals that were spread five million pieces of literature. Jesus was coming soon. And the world had to be warned. Do you know, my friends, never in the history of prophetic interpretation was there such a chorus of voices proclaiming the fulfilment of that great Daniel prophecy. Scholars and leading men of all religious persuasions were convinced that Jesus was coming. Dr. Froome, in his very exhaustive study of 2,000 years of prophetic interpretation, says this, that the approaching terminus of the 2,300 years had a far wider, more numerous and noteworthy body of heralding expositors than any previous fulfilment of Bible prophecy. It was the most widespread prophetic message ever heralded to men up till that time. Oh, my friends, I'm sharing with, with this with you tonight because I don't want you to think that when this great movement God was beginning to raise up, he did it in a corner. It was the most widespread prophetic message ever heralded up till that time. Jesus was coming soon. Now, eventually, of course, they set the date from their study of Scripture as October 22, 1844. Estimates vary as to how many people were waiting for Jesus to come on that day. The most conservative, around about 150,000 people. That doesn't appear to be so small. But do you know, my friends, if we could blow that number up to be comparative to America's population today, it would have been 1.4 million people. A significant movement at that time. 
And just before the date, October 22, on October 20, they published one of the last journals to be published before Jesus was going to come. And they suggested in that journal that we no longer be, want to be called Millerites. We want to be called Adventists. Adventists. Because we believe in the advent of the coming of Jesus. Oh, my friends, what a time to be alive. I've tried to transport myself back to those days, and I'd like you to spend a moment or two thinking about what it must have been like. Shops were closed. Camp meetings were convened. Sins were confessed. Large sums of money were donated to the poor to help them pay their debts. Harvests were left in the fields. Many were baptised. Wrongs were made right. There was a spirit of brotherly love as never had been seen before because Jesus was coming soon. One young teenager whose name you know very, very well wrote at this time, this was the happiest year of my life. My heart was full of glad expectation. If, you, if I could prove to you tonight that Jesus was coming next Sabbath at this camp meeting. What might happen between now and next Sabbath? What would you do? Would you have a new commitment to the Lord? Would you want to leave the campground and share it with your friends, your neighbours, your family back home because you were convinced that Jesus was coming next Sabbath? Just beyond the maple grove where William Miller prayed is a large outcrop of limestone rock. It's interesting that the American Historical Society has called it Ascension Rock because this is where the followers of William Miller in that particular part of America, they met and stood on this outcrop of rock because as you look toward the east, you have a beautiful view of the eastern sky. And not very long ago, I stood on this rock and tried to imagine what it must have been like as those people waited throughout that day for the first signs that Jesus was coming. If you look toward the east, and doubtless the trees have grown since that time, they waited so anxiously for Jesus to come. They expected that they would soon see that little black cloud appearing in the east becoming more and more glorious because Jesus was coming back to the earth to gather his people and they had waited so very, very long for his coming. They waited to see the angels. They waited, waited to hear the angels come. They waited for the end of the world when Jesus would appear to take his people home. Thousands, tens of thousands, waited throughout that day at any time they would see the cloud, at any time they would hear the trumpet sound, they would see their saviour. They would see their loved ones raised from the dead. It was the resurrection day. But my friends, he didn't come. And what a darkness of soul came upon them. He didn't come. And when the clock told 12 that night of October 22, 1844, it was a devastating disappointment. And yet in the plans and purposes of God, that bitter disappointment was to become a magnificent appointment in God's plans. For out of it, a new movement was to grow. A movement that had to take the message to the whole world, including North Queensland, that Jesus was still coming. There was a work to be done. And the message of a soon coming saviour was to catch the hearts of men and women in their millions in the years that lay just ahead. Oh, my friends, it was the certainty of that Advent hope that brought those pioneers to North Queensland a hundred years ago. And may I say that it's the certainty of that same hope that gathers us together in this tent tonight. Because tonight we meet as the spiritual descendants of those men and women 
who came bearing their message that Jesus was coming soon a hundred years ago. We meet today as Seventh-day Adventists because we still believe in the soon coming of Jesus. But we're 160 years removed from 1844. We expected Jesus to have come a long time before this. Why has he delayed so long? Can we be mistaken? Are we losing heart? I want to speak very personally to you tonight, and I don't know you, I don't know where your faith is, but perhaps some of you have come to camp a bit more discouraged that Jesus hasn't come and the world so desperately tonight needs him to come. Has the second coming become just a dim doctrine in your experience? A bewildering hope instead of a blessed assurance? Are we afraid of his coming? Or discouraged because we believe we have to be sinless in order to be ready for his coming? I want to remind us all tonight, dear friends, that though Jesus told us in Matthew 24 that when we see certain signs in the world, we may know his coming is near. He also told us that we wouldn't know the day or the hour. That he would come in an hour when we least expect him to come. But my friends, I want to say to you all tonight, he will come. He is coming. And one day that stone will smite the image on the feet and the toes and destroy it all. And the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. As David Livingston once put, once put it, it is the word of a gentleman of the strictest honour. You can count on his coming. And I believe tonight we shouldn't involve ourselves in the questions of when. We should not allow ourselves to be diverted by those who want to work out dates or times for the coming of Christ. Because any attempt to work out the date or the time will always bring discouragement at the delay when he doesn't come according to our own expectations. In view of the fact that we will not know when he will come, you remember his counsel was, watch and what? Pray and be ready. You remember twice he tells us in Matthew 24, be ready. Be ready. Each day we're to be ready. And I was impressed as I found this statement by William Miller that he wrote just a short time, about a month after the disappointment. Jesus hadn't come. The whole world seemed to collapse about him in a sense. He became the butt of jokes. Why haven't you gone up yet? People would say to him. But this very godly man wrote this in the Advent Herald, one of those little journals. Hold fast. Let no man take your crown. I have fixed my mind upon another time, and here I mean to stand until God gives me more light. And that is today, today, and today, until he comes. And I see him for whom my soul yearns. My friends, as we bring this meeting to a close tonight, I want to ask you, how can we be ready? You know, there are two components for being ready. We've got to get ready, and we've got to stay ready. And of course, we get ready by recognising our need of, as sinners of a saviour. We need to know him as a friend. We need to confess our sins and accept him as our personal saviour and friend. And we must remember tonight, my friends, that there is no sin so grievous that Jesus can't forgive. I'm reminded of the words of the, of the book of Hebrews when the writer says, He is able to save how much? To the uttermost. Who? Those who come to him to make, because he ever lives to make intercession for them. He is able to save to the uttermost, my friends. There is no sin that Jesus can't forgive if we are willing to confess it. That's getting ready. Coming to know Jesus. And how do we stay re ready? How do we stay ready? You remember that Jesus told four stories telling us how we can get ready and be ready and stay ready. And the first of these four stories 
was the story of the faithful and evil servant. You remember Jesus spoke about an evil servant who said in his heart, my Lord delays his coming and he began to go back to his old life to revert back to beating and, and, and getting drunk. The first story is be a faithful servant or an evil servant saying my Lord delays his coming. He's not coming when I expect him and therefore we go back to behaviour we once left. And then Jesus told the second parable, that story of those five wise and five foolish virgins, reminding us of our need to have the Holy Spirit, the oil in our lamps, even though through that sleeping period, because the cry will come forth, behold, the bridegroom comes, and some will not have made the necessary preparation. And Jesus says to them, depart from me, for I never knew you. Think of those words. And then there was the third story of the talents, of the distribution of the talents. And here again, the, the, the man went away for a long time, and after the delay, he came back. And some had invested their talents. One man had just buried it in the ground. Does that say anything about how to stay ready? And then the fourth parable that Jesus told was that beautiful story. And how powerfully does this remind us that the ultimate criteria used in the judgment at the second coming of Christ for determining who are the sheep is the extent to which you and I have shown love for others. My dear friends, I want to remind you tonight that I believe it's significant that in three of those four stories, Jesus spoke that a long time would elapse before his coming. And it's also important that in three of the four stories, he speaks of the importance of doing things for the Christian to stay ready. Doing things. Doing acts of love in the parable of the sheep and goats. Investing your talents for the master's glory. Your behavior, does it revert back to what it once was? Three of the four stories seem to emphasize works. Is Jesus telling us here that the only way to be staying ready is our works, our behavior? Ah, my friends, we miss the story of the gospel if we conclude that. But I guess Jesus is reminding us here tonight that if we know him, then that knowledge and that friendship will manifest itself in how we treat our neighbors, how we invest our talents, for God's glory. And my dear friends, I want to challenge you tonight. Faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. There are some among us tonight who would say that having a relationship with Jesus is the only important thing. It is. It is. But my friends, if we mean that works don't matter, then that theology is wrong. Trust and obey. And we must never emphasize one to the neglect of the other. And Jesus is reminding us, dear friends, that Adventists who are living in the hope of the soon coming of Jesus will make a difference in their communities. We should be known as those who are the most loving and caring Christians in our community if we're living in the hope of the coming of Jesus. In our business dealings, we should be known as those who meet their financial obligations with unquestioned integrity and honesty, if Jesus is our friend. In our homes, we should be demonstrating love and respect and tolerance. We fall short, but as Jesus works in our lives through the presence of his Holy Spirit, that friendship with Jesus will make a difference. All this means uplifting Jesus in our lives, and I want to challenge you tonight at the beginning of this camp meeting, as we look back over a hundred years and think of the courage and the determination and the hope that those men of God had back there, I want to challenge you who are walking in the footsteps of those faithful men and women to live again and to make a consecration of your lives in anticipation that Jesus is coming. And though we may not know the day or the hour, let us, as a result of our friendship with Jesus, know that we are transforming the lives of others by our presence in the communities here in Queensland.
My friends, Jesus is going to come. One day there will be a resurrection. One day we will look up and see the clouds opening up before him and all the angels of heaven coming back to this earth to gather his people home. I pray that you may be faithful and that that which inspired those pioneers a hundred years ago might continue to inspire us to live for him so that Jesus will not say of any of us when he comes, I never knew you. Because being a Christian is coming to know Jesus. And when we know him, it will then lead us to invest our talents for his glory. It will lead us then to bring cold water to those who are thirsty and visit those in prison. When Jesus is our friend, it will lead us to represent him to a world that so desperately needs to see him. I close tonight with these words from the book of Peter. Therefore, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. May the Lord bless us as we think of that glorious day.